But today um, um, we have a very interesting uh, talk or seminar, um, Comoros in Sweden, collaborative work regarding uh, marine management. So a very, very warm welcome to uh, Ilva Jundelius from the Department of Marine Sciences at the University of Gothenburg and the Denmark uh, Technical University. Uh, also very, very warm welcome to Morten Erlansson, who is the who is at the aquatic department, SLU Aqua, at uh, the Swedish University of Ag Agricultural Sciences. And with this, I then leave the floor, the virtual floor to Ilvan Morten. Thank you so much. Uh, I will just share the... So we all see the presentation now? Okay, I assume people see the presentation. Yes. Uh, yes. Then we start. Um, so thank you, Pat, for the introduction. And um, we are going to talk about our visit to the island nation of the Comoros uh, within the Wyosin project that you have already seen mentioned in the chat. Uh, but we will explain a little bit more about that and why we visited Comoros as a part of this project and how what working in the Comoros is like and um, future forums for more extended collaboration. And of course, from our outside perspective. And you don't go to the Comoros without coming home with some really good stories. Uh, so the first one we will try and tell you and you will see it appear again over this presentation is Africa solves the motto we took from the Comoros. Every problem always has a solution. Um, and showing this is the nice little lemur that we did not know lived in the Comoros, but we were happy enough to meet. So I thought we should start with introducing ourselves, but that has already been done. My name is Ilva and uh, Morten, maybe you wanna say hi? Yes, hello, I'm Morten from the Swedish Agriculture University at the Department of uh, Aquatic Resources. Really fun to be here today. And we are part of a larger Bio Symphony team, many of which you've seen in the chat. Uh, the Bio Symphony is a, is a project which was requested by the Nairobi Convention and funded from Sweden, uh, from SIDA and uh, government offices. It's headed by SWAM, uh, by Linus, who's here today, and has a lot of collaborative institutions across Sweden, uh, two of which are ours. Um, it's also uh, the Geological Survey of Sweden um, that is involved. Um, and it, it's a marine spatial planning project, including all the countries that are part of the Nairobi Convention, uh, 10 of them. Um, all of these um, countries have two nominations that are official, um, that are, have been part of working in, this, in a larger team for the past three years. Um, but we also extend the invitation to other regional experts that contribute to developing this project. So what is this project? Morten? Sorry, I was just kicked out of the meeting, but I'm back. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is about the uh, Wire Symphony. Uh, it's a marine spatial planning uh, project uh, that started, it started in this, as a Swedish version, the Symphony project that some of you maybe are familiar with. Uh, so it was in the, uh, during the Swedish MSP process, uh, we had a question, so how to implement ecosystem-based marine spatial planning in, in practice. Uh, and the decision maker needed, uh, and the planners needed a tool how to, um, for, to see the, the entire, uh, the entire uh, picture of the, the cumulative impact from the different uh, 
all the ecosystem components and all the pressures together. So that's how they come up with the symphony tool. Uh, it's based on a, on a paper from Halpern, Halpern at 2000, 2008. Uh, and in the, in the tool, uh, we have three different components. So we have one is the ecosystem components, and then there are the, hum the human activities, so the, the pressures, and then we have a sensitivity matrix. Uh, and I, I'm gonna go through the three components a little bit more here. So the ecosystem components is basically maps uh, from all the different important ecosystem components. Uh, and each, each map should represent uh, what the experts are thinking when they estimate the, the sensitivity from pressures. So for e each of these ecosystem components, uh, the experts will make a score how sensitive it is from each of the pressures. So when we do a, when we do an ecosystem component map, it's important that it uh, represent what uh, what the experts are thinking. Uh, and uh, almost all the layers have some kind of range. It's go, like a value for from high to low. Uh, it could be like abundance of a species or probability of occurrence or species richness, for example. And it's important also that all the layers has covered the entire area. Uh, and the you can see the group of uh, layers that are included in the in the ecosystem components. We have fish, reptiles, mammals, habitats, different kind of ha habitats, and invertebrates. And uh, all the ecosystem components has to be both ecologically and conservationally important to be part of the tool. Uh, and the other part of the tool is the, the pressures. So the pressures are uh, different factors that can, uh, that can cause change in the marine environment. So, and it has to be human activities that, that we can manage. Like all MSB is about managing human activities. So, uh, and they also need to cover the entire area uh, and the idea is to identify which pressures that impacts which, which ecosystem components. And also the ecosystem components is divided into subgroups. And you can see we have 10 different subgroups here. In total, it's about 50 layers of uh, pressures and about 50 layers of ecosystem components. And the next step in the Y symphony is to score the sensitivity. Uh, so for each ecosystem component, or for each pressure, uh, we have experts uh, scoring the sensitivity for each ecosystem component. Uh, and uh, so for if we have 50, 50 ecosystem components and 50, 50 pressures, it means that it is about 2,500 scores to be made. And uh, there's several experts that has scored this in the, according to their own expertise. So, uh, so we will have a, a lot of different scores for every combination. And uh, the end goal of the project is to make a tool and here is this picture is an example from the Swedish symphony. Uh, so in, in the tool, you can both, uh, you can see the, the cumulative impact from all the, all the different pressures on all the different um, uh, ecosystem components. And you can, you can um, also look at individual components and see which, which pressure impacts the most. And uh, there's also possibility to make a scenario, scenario tester. So for example, if you have an idea of an, uh, marine spatial planning and you can have some ideas of, of regulations, you can see how will that regulation affect 
uh, the ecosystem components. For example, if you have a no-take zone for fishing or if you change um, uh, a shipping route or something like that, you can see how that will affect the, the ecosystem components. Uh, and then it's all, you have the possibility to have a report from this tool. You can either choose an, an area that is within the tool or you can make your own area and you can see you can get a report of how how uh, the the scenario you have set up uh, will affect everything, and the tool will be uh, will be web based. So uh, we expect it to be delivered to to the Nairobi Convention at the in this autumn in October, and uh, we also have this this uh, paper if you're interested in, uh, in uh, learning more about the, the tool. And now we have uh, some quiz here in the, um, to lighten up a little. This is a uh, fruit from the Comoros. And uh, we're happy if you guess, guess what the fruit is. So this is level one. You can write in the chat and we will have the reveal later. Are we sure it's a fruit, Martin? That's the question. I am mm -hmm. not, but we'll, we'll we, maybe we get the answer in the guessing in the end. So now it's time to go move over to why we went to the Comoros for this YOSIM project. Uh, the primary reason was to set up a technical studio because we noticed very early on that there was both a demand, but more importantly, a, a strong need uh, for more technical equipment, but also um, education for the Comoros to successfully partake in all the parts of YSIM and for the tool to be viable and useful for them later on. Um, we also needed to understand the infrastructure and the challenges that, that the, the local experts in the Comoros face um, to better understand how to help them and how to uh, communicate which type, um, what type of data and what type of uh, help they want, need, and that we can prov could provide. Uh, but also to, uh, it was also important to actually visit the Comoros to further the collaboration and uh, find new contacts and new ways of getting all the data and to to make all these nice map layers, we need data, we need information. And it was very difficult to find that uh, on a distance from Sweden. Um, but what is the Comoros? I can say I didn't really know until I joined the Viosim project about, um, about the Comoros. Uh, and so if anyone is like me, here's a, we're gonna do a little bit of review. Uh, it's a small island nation in the northern Mozambique channel. It comprises of three islands that are semi-autonomous. Uh, Grand Comor, uh, with the capital island, Moroni. Uh, Moheli, which is the touristy island. Um, the, or the, the beautiful one, as we were told, uh, which is small, the smallest. And Anjuan, which is the agricultural island. Um, the, uh, the big island Grand Comor is a volcanic island. So uh, while both Moheli and Andrian are quite lush. Um, the Comoros was in, became independent from France in 1975. And you can definitely tell that in society uh, with a lot of French influences and fr uh, French still being a strong language. Uh, but we also noticed that it, it is very it has very strong ties with the Arab world and that is very prominent. Uh, there are three official languages, Shikomori, French and Arabic. Uh, and Shikomori is the local language that we actually found was the, the language spoken most. Um, the Comoros make claim on Mayotte uh, as the fourth Comoros. Mayotte is an island that when they became independent from France, decided to stay with France. Um, and this picture shows a sign that 
is in the entrance to Moroni, the capital, that we found very interesting. Um, and we should say that in Wayusim, we do not take any stand on the decision of Mayot. We go with the UN ruling in all the map makings. Um, but before going to the Comoros, we, we tried finding out information and it was quite difficult. And I think I can safely say that at least from my perspective, none of the information that we found turned out to be accurate. Um, so what did we do? In the course. So we had a seven day long visit. Um, on due to our poor planning, it ended up being at the end of Ramadan, uh, which might was not that nice to our hosts that had to work, uh, and our apologies for that, but it was very nice for us who got to experience this uh, special time. So despite it being a holiday time, we had technical trainings and a studio set up uh, both in Moroni and in Moheli. Uh, we visited uh, the, uh, Moheli and the marine park to learn about how they work uh, with more hands-on marine data collection. And we also as we said with Africa Salt, we also ended up having a surprise visit to the island of Anjouan when our plane had a little detour. Uh, so we got to see most of the Comoros um, before returning home. So the technical studio comprises of um, providing technical equipment and setting it up um, after the after per request from, from the Comorians. And this was referred to by the Swedish embassy in Nairobi as what they thought was maybe Sweden's first capacity building intervention in the Comoros. There has not been um, much happening there. Uh, and it was very much needed. We noticed that early on. There is what we could see, there was no, no place to actually buy the technical equipment in the Comoros. Um, so it, it was um, definitely not possible to solve in other ways. Um, and as we said, as I said before, it's vital for them to be part of Biosim. Um, so we, went, we have had technical trainings within the Biosim project uh, throughout the last year and this year, and it was offered online, but the Comorians already explained to us that it was a bit difficult to follow. So we went over some of the trainings again, but also worked with local data uh, from the Comoros. And here you see uh, our two technical working group members, uh, Madi and Saifa, and as well as some extra invited uh, people from a local NGO. Um, and we also managed to discuss what data was missing. We reviewed some of the maps that have been created for the Comoros already and realized when we were on site how much we were actually missing and that we now can help. And now it's time for the second fruit. So if you have any guess, please write in the chat and I'm not sure it is a fruit. Uh, but yes. Now we move on to Muheli and uh, the Parc National de Muheli, which was uh, Madi, our technical working group member, um, his place of employment. And it was for 20 years uh, Comoros only national park, but recently there was some news that they are creating five more. And it has been financed for a long time by both European and French projects. Uh, and it's a long standing and well known establishment in the area. And it is very, I found it very special that it covers so much of the island. It covers about 75% of the whole island of Moheli uh, from sea, coral reefs, rainforest, and um, freshwater crater lakes. It has everything. Um, and we visited the park head office in the village of Nikashua. 
I will not take it upon myself to pronounce that better. And the last two pictures you saw are some of the houses in that village and the main village street. The beach is the beach right outside of the park office. Um, and Moheli, we just stayed in that little village, but from what we could see there, the nature is spectacular. Um, we both went uh, snorkeling and diving and uh, to have a to look at the coral reef and it was a very healthy coral reef and very beautiful with fish but you could definitely tell that there is fishing which was witnessed um, we heard some stories from the local on how the reef is fished um, and the traditions around that there are many endemic species on Mujeli. One is the living stone bat in the rainforest. Here compared with another bat, the normal one that you find all over the Comoros. Um, we never expected to see them, so that was very cool. And uh, one of Mujeli's big, or the Comoros' biggest exports is vanilla. And um, um, we saw a lot of vanilla. And here's a little extra slide on Eid in Moheli. So we were fortunate enough to have Eid move uh, from the 2nd of May to the 3rd of May and when we were still in Ikashua. And we were invited to take part in the local celebrations. And it was a very festive day and it's better illustrated with a video. Um, but yeah, it was fortunate for us and unfortunate for our hosts that we visited this day. Um, we went back into uh, to Moroni and as we also previously mentioned, we did meet, try to do some networking and meet a lot of people. Um, so we were set up with a meeting by the UN coordinator in the Comoros from the Swedish embassy. Um, and they also set up a meeting with the French embassy, which is the only European embassy in, in the Comoros. The other embassies present are China, Saudi Arabia, Iran, and Qatar. Um, we also met some non-governmental organizations, um, IDE, which was part of the technical training, and Cordio, uh, which we have uh, previously worked with in, um, in Kenya. They were also, we also received this contact beforehand and reached out to them and they found the other participants, the IDA organization for the, uh, for the technical training. So by reaching out to one contact, we usually ended up with five more. Um, our technical training in, in Moroni took place uh, at the Ministry of, for Agriculture, Fishery and Environment, um, as you see pictured above. And um, in the meeting, uh, in the top left picture, you see uh, Josh from Cordio in the back and Najim in front. Najim is also the um, focal point for the IOC, International Oceanographic Commissions in the Comoros. And uh, in Muheli, we also met the Laka Lodge gurus, as I would like to call them. And while they are not official, they were extremely helpful. Uh, the Laka Lodge is the only hotel in the southern part of Moheli, and it's run by a Belgian couple who have worked in the Comoros for a long, long time with developmental uh, development issues. And they were very helpful in both explaining the history to us of how things have changed, but also in finding Africa solutions for us. For example, on the 3rd of May, when we were going back, our, we needed to take a PCR test uh, to be able to leave the Comoros the day after. And when our flight was canceled, they arranged for the PCR test to take a boat while we waited for a new airplane. Um, so without them, we would have still, we would probably still be in Mojave. Um, we also visited the University of Comoros 
which I didn't know existed before we came to Moroni. Uh, but it turns out there is a university and it does not only have campuses on Moroni, but on all the, on the other two islands as well. And it teaches up to master's level with the education language being mainly French. Uh, but ma many of the students do speak English. Um, it's not common for the Comorian, from what we understood, to stay in the Comoros for higher uh, education. Um, but Najim, the focal point that we met before, is also in charge of the Marine Master's program. And uh, we discussed some about how, how we could help improve um, the quality, but also have some, some exchange with the university. Um, this, especially the French ambassador ex, um, explicitly conveyed the importance of this as um, this education and uh, being something that uh, needs to put, get more focus in the Comoros. And they were really helpful with the providing information where to get data and which, which kind of surveys that had been made on Comoros. So that was really helpful as well. Yes, and as you see, they have some they have some good uh, facilities. Um, so, but Comoros, in many ways, suffers from brain drain. Where educated, um, many educated people choose to to leave. Um, and with that, we are going to guess the third fruit that uh, neither me nor Morten knew what it was or had ever heard of before. But we tasted. This is level extreme hard. Very hard. Uh, so future uh, challenge. Um, so with, in all these meetings, we talked a bit about future challenges and what, what, and what they saw as, as things to work on in the commerce, but also from what we experienced. And I think both, both of us can say that waste management was the first thing we thought of. Um, this is not an uncommon site. This is um, basically all litter that exists goes into the ocean. And uh, there had been projects trying to establish getting a garbage truck to, to the island, to Moroni, uh, which had been unsuccessful. Um, but just such a small thing as not throwing batteries straight into the water would make a huge difference here. Um, the Comoros also has a very young demographic. Uh, there was an estimate that half the population uh, would be under 25. And with that comes the demand on education, but also language as they see a deterioration. Uh, the French uh, ambassador um, expressed uh, seeing a deterioration in the French language, making um, the students unable to go to university in France and therefore opting to stay in, in an Arabic speaking country um, or, or speaking Kikomori. There's all, uh, there are many people that, that do not um, know how to read and write in the Comoros. But we discussed um, a lot about how to, how to change this trend, but also how, um, how, we, how um, they would benefit from an international exchange in, in these questions. Um, and then here are some other notes that we um, took regarding how C is viewed in the Comorian society, if that is a good way to express it. Um, if you see the, the nice fruit market, the lady in the back is wearing coral sunscreen, which is very common. It's something, um, it was something worn mainly by women. Uh, it's a coral made from dead corals, um, a, like facial paste that both protects against the sun, but it's supposed to be healing. And we were also told about the tradition of, uh, tox uh, of toxin fishing. From Cordio, we heard that they, um, 
that there is a neurotoxin made from a flower thrown on octopuses by rocks. And from the French embassy, we heard that it was cyanide fishing. So we are not really, we did not experience it. We did not see it, but it was something we had not um, thought about or even considered when ranking fishing methods in the Weissen project. Uh, as for fishing on itself, um, there is no large scale port in Moroni. Like the container ships, they anchor outside and it is brought into the mainland. Uh, this is a picture of what we experienced was the fish market. Um, but there is, and it's not huge. There is not a lot of fishing, uh, of large scale fishing from what we could see. Uh, we found some, um, from Cordia, we heard some reports of um, shark, fin fi shark fins being sold um, in markets and of foreign fishing fleets coming, co coming to the Comoros, but it was nothing that we experienced and heard or heard more about. Um, and then we have some tips and tricks that we learned. First, the picture shows the Volo Volo market in Moroni, which is the place to go for everything. We didn't see a lot of stores. Um, I don't think we saw any stores, but you can buy everything at Volo Volo and it is the central place. And I think I speak for both of us, we've never seen a market like this. Um, when we came to the Comoros, neither me nor Morton speak very well French. So we were kind of worried about how the language would work out, but it turns out to not be that big of a problem. Yes, it would have been easier speaking French, of course, or even better Kikomori, but it, but English works. Um, Maybe we were lucky also. I, I don't know, but uh, we were lucky that we always had an English speaking person. But we also available. had, we were not, we were the only uh, tourists that we saw for many of, like, I don't think we saw any other tourists. Uh, so people walked up to us and in the beginning we were a bit skeptical, but it turns out most of the time they just wanted to offer help and give out their WhatsApp number so that if we ever needed translation, we could contact them. Uh, and that was a huge help to know that we could always ask someone. Um, we were well taken care of by our hosts as well. So, um, but um, the, we had some cultural shocks uh, trying to take cap taxis and uh, figuring out how to, how to pay for things. But Africa solves. Uh, so it was actually easier than anticipated from the beginning. Um, and I must say, I'm very, I was very um, impressed with the work ethic of our colleagues in the Comoros that came and worked during Ramadan and worked longer than planned um, just because we came. Um, so, but it was definitely difficult from a Swedish perspective that we, we might like planning a bit more in our in a way we might not be as clear always with what we need. So that was something that in the end, I at least understood that we needed to improve. But we came there and set, uh, we successfully set up the studio and we got through all the technical training needed. So I would say, we solved the problems that we met. So how will we continue the work for, with the Comoros uh, for Wyosim? Uh, the technical training will continue. There are a few more online sessions. Um, we already discussed this on occasion to set up an active Comoros group, which, which, are, which they did, um, and to help support that uh, their ability to support each other in and creating and adding more people that might know things that are is relevant. 
Um, the tool, the Y simple tool, as mentioned, will be operational later this year, and we will hopefully be able to continue the training and um, upgrade it so that it becomes of use for the government in, of the Comoros. And that this tool being so, um, including all the neighboring countries, um, will help enable a better collaboration for, for the marine environment. Uh, other interests that we, that we saw and uh, that were brought up in various discussions we had was the establishment of the new MPAs, um, that it would be great to have involvement from more nations with experience in this. Um, the Northern Mozambique Channel Project, which is uh, funded by the World Bank to map oil and uh, to estimate the impacts that drilling for oil in the Northern Mozambique Channel will have on, on the countries surrounding it. Um, and of course, blue economy questions, which are um, very relevant and I think yeah, seems pretty new in, in the Comoros. Uh, and of course, it's something that is of highest value to them with as much coastal zone as they have. Um, but also setting up a university exchange or research education to help um, both to understand better of the, uh, to get a better picture of the data and what it's like in the Comoros because it has not been been surveyed, but also providing the possibility and knowledge uh, for, for that job to be continued to do done locally. So I think we can conclude that we were very happy in the Comoros. Or oh, what do you say, Morten? Uh, no doubt. This was a really, really great experience. Um, we... Um, uh, it, it was mostly due to the people being so kind and so nice and always uh, solving everything for us when we were confused. Um, you see us eating uh, fried breadfruit in the conference room of the hotel because we didn't make the buffet because it was Ramadan. Uh, <laughs> you see Morten behind the bars in the airport, but he got out. Uh, it was... Um, and uh, we finally found a plane back into the capital. Uh, yes, and with that, the best part I brought with me back home was Africa solves a little bit of the mentality that everything usually works out in the end. Nice. And with that, it's time for the fruit reveal. <laughs> okay, that didn't go well. Um, the first one was an avocado, and the second one was chocolate, which or cacao, which I don't know if it is a fruit. And do you want to take the last one, Morten? Uh, the last one was called sakwa. I don't think it has an English or a Swedish name. But... Uh, uh, I, I think in French uh, it's uh, uh, pomme de citre in French. I don't know in English. All right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, we we have it everywhere in the island. You can find them. Yeah, I have never seen it before. So. Yeah, yeah, okay. We tried looking so hard for them the last day to fly some back for our Wyosim team, but since we left the day after Eid, nobody has been out picking. But we oh, tried okay. them, and we were surprised to find the. It has a big seed, like a nectarine, in the inside. Oh, okay. You can make juice also. It's it's very sweet and nice. But the second one is cacao. It's papaya. It's papaya. It's not cacao. The second one. Ah, okay. Then we didn't. Need it's, it. No, it's papaya because papaya, when it's not yet uh, ready to eat, it's green. Okay. But we make some thing that we call anchar when we eat because when when inside it's uh, it's white when it's green, but when it's ready to eat inside it's yellow. This is papaya, not cacao. Okay, we will. Thank you for clarifying that. We didn't the second that. one. Yeah. Yes. Oh, then, <laughs> yeah. then I get to be embarrassed. Um, a side thing before this was that neither, none of us were big uh, 
fruit with a, we didn't have a lot of fruit knowledge so we had a fun time in the course trying all the fruits like your guavas were wonderful yeah we will see. oh thanks a lot in van morten um uh, for this presentation um super interesting interesting project and also at least for me uh, a kind of a new and very interesting con context uh, i feel i want to know more about